Good evening and welcome to Brass Tax. Hosted by and produced by Frederick Brass. I'm Coley Clark, your host for the evening. I'm from the Judicial Violence Symposium, a story yet to come. I am very excited, New York, this evening, and I do mean excited, because I have here with me, and Fred and I have both enjoyed and been joining him all afternoon, Kevin Arnett. Kevin Arnett, in a word, can be described as a powerful organizer, a man of high moral principles and high stature. He has been recommended for a Nobel Peace Prize, among other great honors. He has a number of books, and you'll be looking at two of them tonight. But the first one we're going to look at is Murder by Decree, The Crime of Genocide in Canada. It's about Canada's most sentenced story. The holding on to a vicious cycle of lies about crimes that have lasted for more than a century, but certainly across most of the last century coming into this century before Kevin exposed it to the entire world. And that is a crime of genocide against natives and native children. Kevin's best focus has been on those native children. Murder by decree. State-sponsored violence. State-sponsored violence. And so I'm going to be talking tonight with Kevin about the true meaning of this remarkable document that he has put together. Um, it's a counter report to the Truth and Recon Re Reconciliation Commission's report. And what's great about this one is that Kevin documents detail for detail, including pictures, uh, statements from the natives. Uh, we just go straight through. It's a, it's a work that every one of us has to read. We have to read this book. We owe it to ourselves to read this book in light of the recent uh, um, expose in the United States, the recent expose uh, with Harper's Magazine on America's violence against Africans in the United States, against black Americans in the United States. Uh, this is certainly a complimentary crime, if not a greater crime. But when you see the story of children between 1923 and 1996 actually being destroyed, and this man actually proves it, he doesn't just talk. Kevin documents case by case, study by study, individual by individual, and of course, he pays the price. But tonight, Kevin, let's start talking about murder by decree. Murder by decree, the crime of genocide in Canada, and why the Canadian government has censored this story. Kevin, talk to me. It's, it's always good, good to have you. It's, it's always it's, <laughs> it's always good to be here. I don't know, Kevin. This stuff love, is so heavy that I it's hard to even here. just sit. Yeah. and chat with you about it because we're talking about human beings. Yeah. We're talking about the lives of people and ultimately we're talking about the environment. It's all part of the same crime, you know. Um, I, uh, you know, look at this and I reflect back 20 years now because that's when it started for me. Yes. I was a pastor on the west coast of Canada and I began to give a forum for native people in my church. I thought mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. part of my job. You know, okay. welcome in the stranger, welcome in those we've wronged. And with Native people, when you give them a forum, they start talking. They take that invitation seriously. So okay. from my pulpit, this would have been between the years 1993 and 95, over 20 years now, um, we began to hear the stories for the first time about children being killed in these Indian boarding schools run by the Catholic, United, and Anglican Church of England schools. Uh, backed by the Canadian government right up to 1996 where the death rate was over 50 percent decade after decade and nobody had talked about that until you know I began to publish this after the church fired me 
one of the things that that's what inspired you. Yes, we'll okay, get to that. Okay, of course. we'll, get, we'll to get, that. get to that. We'll come to um, that. This is New York. <laughs> this is from the government's own archives. It's a um, and again, murderbydecree.com is a website. People can look at this themselves. It's a report by a guy called Dr. Peter Bryce, and he was a medical chief medical officer for the in Canadian government when it came mm -hmm. to Indians. You'll notice there, this is described in the blood, CE means um, Church of England school, in Alberta, where uh, 38 children were alive and 36 were dead. So that's a 50% death rate. That's in the year 1909. 40 years later, you've got the same death rate. Same death rate. It's high, high death rate. Now Run right in half, half the th children. That happened because they were taking the healthy children locking them in the same dormitories as the kids dying of tuberculosis and smallpox, never treating them. And that practice happened in 1909. It happened 50 years later as well. It was constant. Now, today the Canadian government and churches say, well, it's unfortunate so many children died, but we weren't trying to do it. Well, then how come they were locked at sick and the healthy 50 years apart, the same practice is going on. Obviously, it's intentional. It's a way to get rid of the natives because they wanted the land, yeah. especially in Western Canada. Well, I mean, how do you, as a school administrator, Kevin, did you talk with any of the administrators at all? You know, after the um, the lawsuits began about this, and I was actually uh, helping the first group of natives who ever sued the churches of government in Canada uh, back in 1995, and eventually it, it caused the first legal decision in Canada, ca Canada. It was called the Brenner decision in the British Columbia Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. And the first group of natives who were suing had been in my congregation. So I was giving them advice and encouragement. And um, you know, the, the very first person who began to tell these stories said, I saw my best friend killed in the school and then they buried him in the hills behind the school. And they all know about it. All the church people know about it. And uh, they don't want us in their churches for that reason. Now, as soon as that story broke, not only was I tossed out of the church and they la made my life total hell, but um, they clammed up. So nobody in the church of the governments would say a thing. The lawyers took over, as they still do, and uh, no one was allowed to say anything. So I very rarely would meet any of the white people who actually worked in these, these so-called schools. Although once a woman called Marion McFarlane uh, stood up at one of our forums and described how she had seen children beaten and beaten to death and buried out behind the school. Whoa, 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 no, no, no. Slow me down. Mrs. McFarlane testifies that she has seen children actually physically beaten to death? Yes. Um, there was two incidents uh, involving a principal, Alfred Caldwell, who was a United Church minister and principal of the Alberni and a house at Indian schools. Uh, this is on Vancouver Island on the west coast of Canada. Okay. Eyewitnesses, uh, two of them saw those kids both, w well, the a little boy, Albert Gray, was beat. he had taken a prune out of a jar when he wasn't supposed to, and so he was beaten so badly by Caldwell, he died the next day. Uh, I talked to the two people who buried him. Uh, then sh he kicked a little girl called Maisie Shaw to her death down a flight of stairs because she was crying for her mother one night. That was witnessed by Harriet Nahani. Um, and it's all been documented in court records, in uh, by journalists. But you know, it's all out there. When the amazing thing is, in Canada, not a single person has ever even gone to trial for the death of over fifty thousand children. So to talk about a cover up, and a deal worked out so no one would ever be prosecuted, is to put it mildly. What would happen if someone had really challenged Kevin? Are there no challenges at all? No parent challenge? No no well, neighbors, no anybody challenged? And when Indians tend to challenge these things, they end up dead. Um, white people like me who challenge it end up uh, blacklisted, censored, completely ostracized, uh, turned into a leper in your own culture. I can't get work. I can't get any media coverage anymore because everything I've, I've published has been proven. Last June in the New York Times, June f uh, 3rd, 2015, it said Canada admits cultural genocide. Now, they always put that word cultural in front yes, and try to yes. soften it, but they admitted... It was about the music. In the newspaper article, they admitted, Canada admitted that thousands of children died and it was genocide. Okay, mm -hmm. well, that's like saying, I remember in a forum once a Native woman stood up and said, you know, when white people apologize, it's like when somebody steals your car and then they come to you the door and, uh, and knock on the door and say, gee, I'm sorry I stole your car, and then they get in the car and drive away. Huh. You know, it's, it's <laughs> like, yeah, they apologize, whatever that could mean to a corpse. I don't know what an apology means to a dead child. But um, 
then everything carries on the same way. I mean, yeah, but culture in, 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 in this case is replacing human. So, sure, humans have culture. Bacteria have culture. <laughs> you know, but when we say culture, New York, I think you will agree with me, it's an attempt to, well, it's a blatant, outright lie. Because we're not talking about culture, we're talking about the murder of a group of people who may be different only in, in their ethnicity or their racial identity. Mm -hmm. They might have cultures, music, art, drama, whatever they do that may be different than the group that's killing them. But also, what's troubling me, Kevin, is that the crime falls not on the judicial, it's not falling, uh, falling on the state, it's not falling on the churches and the schools, it's falling on the people of Canada. Well, that's right, and you know, the, uh, the thing that, that prompted me to write this book is, uh, after a lot of the campaigns we did, and, and by we, I mean a few Native people and myself who kept pressing this issue after mm -hmm. I got fired by the church, and I began to work with people over a period of 20 years. We were occupying churches. We were creating a total public stink about this, mm -hmm. holding forums, documenting everything. The Canadian government realized, well, we got to do something. So they launched this in-house inquiry, like guilty parties always do when you're in power. And they set they up the white paper. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they set up their own inquiry. They control the inquiry. If you're a native person, you had a story to tell. They had to look at your statement first, and they censored out anything that might name a person who killed a child, that might talk about genocide or sterilization programs, or any of the things that were operating in these places. Uh, and then at the end, they said, well, yes, it's true, these, these unfortunate things happen, uh, but then there's no outcome. Nobody's charged, nothing changes. Yes. And we realized we had to write a counter report. Uh, to sh and, and in fact, what this work does is it, it shows and publishes the material the Canadian government actually censored out of their, their stuff. And a, a perfect example is that uh, death record I showed you where mm -hmm. the death rate was constant over decades. That figure in itself shows that it couldn't be an accidental. If you have half the children die in 50 years apart, obviously it's deliberate or the conditions would have been improved and the death rate would have mm -hmm. gone down. But we also found in the document... Oh, it's one hell of a coincidence. Well, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a simple logic. They were trying to depopulate whole areas under the guise of religion and education. And, um, you know, it, uh, another critical piece of evidence in this whole crime investigation is the very first year the residential schools opened in the West in the year 1891, I published records showing that even in that first year, two-thirds of the children were dying. Now, in other words, this isn't a disease that's gradually building over time. Bang, the very first year they're together the, in the schools, half to two-thirds of the children die off. Now, now that, that, <laughs> that, that, that 1890 period is also a period for yellow fever and, mm -hmm. and uh, tuberculosis has come in, smallpox. So they're not dying from these diseases. They are, well, when you look at the death rate on the Indian reservations at the time, it was around 5 to 7 percent. You go into an Indian school and it's 50 percent. Oh my God. So, in other words, these are death traps, mm -hmm. and yet the government makes it a law that the children had to be in them. They abolish medical inspection. They make the churches the legal guardian. They bring in s programs to allow the sterilization of, of Indians, and Indians are not allowed under the law to even hire lawyers during this time. So it's all of that, when you put all those facts together, it's clear the state and the church were working together to wipe out as many natives as possible in these schools. Natives can't hire a lawyer. No. And this has appeared from 1890 to what, about 1920? That didn't change till the 1950s, actually. Oh, till the 1950s. I Indians weren't l citizens in Canada till the, the 1960s. And even then, under the Indian Act, they're still not, they're considered wards of the state, which means they're not fully competent adults under the law if you live on a reservation in Canada. It's like an apartheid system in Canada. Well, this m sounds more like uh, the German system called concentration camps. That's exactly what they were, yeah. That's a, that is really cold-blooded. Because what we are talking about here is you, you have no legal representation. You have no rights which anyone need respect. Now, that's a 1859 decision involving Africans in mm -hmm. a case uh, in, in Missouri. And here you have uh, the Dred Scott case, and you have a judge saying, you know, that 
black folk and Negroes didn't have any law that anyone need respect. And here I see the living evidence. Mm -hmm. What you're presenting is the living evidence of a people who have no rights that any Canadian need respect. Well, that's exactly right, Coley, and that's why the crime continues today. Uh, the new government, liberal government in Canada, has announced uh, an inquiry, uh, yet another government-controlled inquiry, into missing Aboriginal women. Now, I have personal knowledge of this because I worked as a street minister in Vancouver on the West Coast for many years. Mm -hmm. I worked with, with a lot of the women who, uh, you know, who were trying to document in their neighborhood why so many were going missing. We documented almost a thousand cases of Native women just vanishing, and the Royal Canadian Mount of Police Ha officially say, well, there was a few dozen. And one of the reasons they say that is they themselves are involved in these disappearances, that these are racially targeted women. We found that if you trace the history of these Native women going missing, they are from the traditional matriarchal clan mothers who traditionally held ownership of the land. So if you're a big corporation, you want to get the land and get the government-controlled Native chief to sign it off to you, you've got to get rid of the traditional uh, clan mothers who know the real story of who whose land it is. Mm -hmm. And so these disappearances are actually, I believe, being targeted by big money, by big mm -hmm. corporations, uh, including Chinese cartels that are now operating all over northern Canada. To Chinese cartels. Ca Chinese, not just American oh, multinationals, but the Chinese, trying to get the resources, uh, oil, uranium, water, is what Canada is good for in their mind. I mean, oil, uranium, and water. Yes, and native water people. Water being urgent. Native people sit on a lot of those mm. resources, and uh, that's, I believe, what's behind a lot of these disappearances today. So it's ongoing genocide. You know, I, I, I saw the story maybe, maybe 15 years ago, where I think it's the Mohawk and, and a golf course. Mm -hmm. Somebody wanted to build a golf course. Uh, right. So they go in and war on the natives and run them off of their land because they need to build a golf course. Such a, non a non-essential. That was in Oka, north of here in Montreal. They yeah. And they brought in the Canadian Army, and there was a big standoff. Yeah, well, the natives didn't back down. No, they didn't. As I recall. No. The no. incident. But I was recalling an incident in Scotland where we have a man that's running for office in the U.S. who wants to build a golf course. He's destroyed the world's most famous bogs in <laughs> order to build a golf course. And the homes of the people near the, the bog, he needed a golf course. We need to, I don't know, I, I, Kevin, I, I wonder sometime about human beings. I really do, about human beings and our respect for each other beyond the words, beyond the religions, beyond the games we play with each other. Mm -hmm. Because this is a deadly, beastly game. I understand that the Cree is the Cree Indians who can't come off of their reservations because it's been nuclear, nuclear contamination? Well, in northern Saskatchewan, um, the corporation called CAMCO, which also does uranium mining in the Black Hills of South Dakota. They're the ones who are poisoning the Lakota people. Russell Means, our yes, brother there yes. with the American Indian Movement, he just died of colon cancer. Yeah, oh, goodness. There isn't a family in the Rosebud and Pine Ridge Reservations there who don't have cancer in their family because of this massive contamination. Same thing's happening all over northern Canada. And you can't even go into those areas, and I've tried. The Army has it sealed off. You can't even go into those areas to look at the devastation being caused by the uranium mining. That's where the U.S. military gets their depleted uranium from, Cree land in Canada. So that accounts for the stories that people have seen U.S. military coming in and out of Canada. Oh, they operate all the time. Um, U.S. Oh Marines, the Homeland Security, uh, FBI, DEA. You see their agents operating routinely. Uh, and so, you know, I, this is a... A much bigger crime than simply a few children disappeared. I mean, this is intergenerational genocide, and it's carrying on right now. New York, are you listening? Are, are we really listening? Because you've got to, New York. We have got to begin to do these studies. We've got to read these books. Murder by Decree, The Crime of Genocide in Canada by Kevin Annette, an accomplished researcher, an accomplished organizer, it is just urgent that we begin to, to look at this because we can't just let it pass. Because if we let it pass, it's bound to, to increase here where it has not disappeared. Now, you can get that, just so people know, you can get that on Amazon.com um, and my second book, which I think we'll talk about in the other interview. Yeah, we will talk about yes. it. But I, but I want to con continue to talk about this murder by decree and genocide. You know, the UN Commission on Genocide, um, well, on human rights, uh, has had a few things to say about genocide. 
generally when we think of Jean de Sade, we refer to Germany and World War II and the crime against Jewish people in Germany. It is seldom when we think of genocide that we think of the indigenous populations of the United States. And I was reflecting just for a second on George Washington's statement on the goal of the United States of America, uh, the, that at that time, the republic, the new republic. He was speaking in 1787. When he, to paraphrase, he said that the goal of the new nation, uh, the new republic, would be to destroy the wolf and the savage, moving from east to west, setting up a base in the west, and then moving southward. The goal, the goal. Here's someone talking about a new republic with a goal of destroying the helpless wolves of the land and the savages. Putting them in the same category. Well, Amen. the Mohawk have a word for uh, George Washington in their language, and I know this, um, I worked a lot among the Mohawk for a number of years, including helping to excavate at the site of one of the schools where we've actually found bones of children and buttons off school uniforms. Oh. But that was shut down by the government very quickly in two 2011. But anyway, when I was there among the Mohawks, uh, they described how traditionally they had allied with the British during the revolution. So after the British left, the Mohawks were driven out of New York up into Canada. Mm -hmm. And uh, their name for George Washington is Crop Burner because George Washington and General Clinton burned about 200 miles of corn in New York State and just destroyed their, their whole base of their society and um, turned them into refugees. So, I mean, yeah, it's that same um, genocide that's right there from the very beginning, and not just in America. All the stuff goes back to Rome. Uh, the Vatican is really the force behind a lot of this. The Jesuits set up the original Indian schools in America and Canada. Mm. And they had that whole idea that if you weren't a Catholic, uh, you didn't have the right to live. And if yes. you if you were an Indian or it's a, sort of a, a sure black South person, America, yeah, the Spanish. You they, yes. If you got baptized, you could be enslaved. But if you didn't get baptized, you could just be wiped out like like a wild animal. So that's still standard policy. Those papal bulls allowing that have never been taken off the books. In, and in, apparently, uh, the, in the practices Vatican. have been taken off either, Kevin. No, no, they haven't. So that's really a part of the tragedy that we are faced with is that we as a people in the U.S., in Canada, in Mexico, and Central America have not been able to, that is progressive-minded people who are bent on treating human beings as human beings with respect for the laws we create, uh, the lies we create in often cases because the laws become lies because we have no respect for them. But until we decide that we are going to end this great tragedy, end this great tragedy short of the total genocide. Because we're talking about the total genocide now here, here of, of this people. And when I was uh, thinking about uh, these artificial earthquakes that we have in that as a result of fracking because we, are s we, 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 we say we need more oil so we destroy the, the ground level water and also create artificial earthquakes. When I look at pipelines running across the country, uh, stretching to Canada, uh, to what end, Kevin? Money. That's what's behind you all war. Money. Yeah, but you can't drink money. It, it, it struck me right away, like it, it, you know, talking to hundreds and hundreds of eyewitnesses as I've done over the years about this. You know, your mind can try to understand the stuff, but the um, the, the heart can't. And when you when you try to uh, fathom it, it doesn't make any sense. And you could say, well, it was all about grabbing lands and resources and everything. But there's got to be some deeper evil responsible for this. And I don't have an answer to it yet, because I've seen how the majority of people, when they have a job, are willing to do the most heinous things, uh, the most murderous things, or turn a blind eye and turn the other way. And that's what the real enemy is. Uh, like Martin Luther King said, it's not the evil people that are the problem. It's those who knew better and do nothing. Yeah, that's true. Yep. Silence. Remain yep. in silence. Yep. Um, we have to break the silence. We're looking here at murder by decree, the crime of genocide in Canada. Between 1923 and 1996, Kevin Arnett, sitting here with me, has well documented the mass murder of more than 50,000 Canadian children. We're just talking about the children. 
We're not talking about the mass murder of their parent and others that's occurring in this same time period mm -hmm. because parents fight back. They're forced into these native schools by the government. Most of these schools are run by the Catholic Church and the Anglican Church. And it's within these schools with these trusted religious figures that children lose their lives in multiple ways. And some of the ways are so frightening that it scares me out of my seat. Yet I'm driven to say that there has to be change, New York, that we cannot afford to stand by. I'm Coley Clark. I'm with the Judicial Violence Symposium. We're on our way into Princeton Theological Seminary this summer to hold the first major symposium on judicial violence in the United States, and we are coupling that with Canada and the crime of genocide, the judicial violence against Canadian people, especially against Canadian women and children. I invite you, New York, to tune in. Good evening, New York, and welcome to Brass Tax, produced by Frederick Brass. I'm Coley Clark from the Judicial Violence Symposium, and I'm your host for this evening. And you see me all excited and shaking my head and stuff? I am so happy that I have a game with me, Kevin Arnett. Kevin Arnett is the very powerful and famous young man who's done such <laughs> <laughs> great work in such a short lifespan. And Kevin, I hope it doesn't get shorter. No, but well, the, the I, work I is fine. <laughs> and I've been, been out in civil rights and human rights for a long time. Mm. And I know that the evil go after men and women like you, children like you, uh, when they are doing the work of exposing the ugly violence and evil that we have in our world. I am so excited this evening, Kevin, to talk about a second book on your road tour. <laughs> you will uh, be touring the United States. Oh, uh, what are you looking at, nine weeks, 10 weeks? Well, as long as it takes. <laughs> as long as it takes to get the word out. <laughs> well, you can't get it out in Canada anymore because Canada has, in fact, uh, placed Kevin on his watch list. And we need to be talking about that New York because Kevin does need our protection and our care. And we should make sure that the great men and women who have done the work of exposing the evils, whether it's the evil of Canada or the U.S. or whatever, uh, don't get uh, removed and unable to do that work in multiple kinds of ways. They move King with a bullet and others with bullets, but they move us and remove us in other ways as well, making it impossible to, to, to live, making it impossible to find housing, making it impossible to live a normal life. Kevin's on road tour and he's out here presenting his book to the world, Unrelenting, Between Sodom and Zion by Kevin on that. And for those of you who saw the last show, his major work, his major work, Murder by Decree. Murder by Decree, the crime of genocide in Canada. And all of this is about Canada's up and up, hot, cold machinery to censor the truth in the stories that are being told by Kevin Annette. But what I like about this story, Kevin, this is your story. This is the 20-year the saga, well, longer than 20 years now, of me learning about the murder of children in the Indian residential schools, uh, talking about it and getting fired, not just fired from my church, but expelled from my livelihood, uh, losing my family over it, um, being blacklisted across the country and attacked in, in countless ways. Uh, not even because of me so much as what I was bringing out, what I, what I represented, which is Canada's guilty conscience that it committed mass murder and is still continuing those same crimes against Native people and, and many other groups. You know, Kevin, I was looking here at, 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 at your preference and going through and looking at your dedication, 
And I was remarked, I rem just uh, moved to tears when I read a little bit of this. And I want to read it to New York. But then this is Kevin writing. But the biggest impact you've had has been on my 10-year-old daughter. He's speaking to a Native woman, a Native woman who is talking to Kevin about his impact on her life and that of her family. She watched your film with me the other night, and she was in tears by the end. She said to me, now, now I guess my grandmother can have some peace wherever she is. This is a missing Native woman among the multiple missing Native women in Canada. She doesn't have to be alone anymore. This reverend has helped her to go to the light. Right, Mama? And the reverend she's referring to is to Kevin. And I told her, yes, that's true. And she smiled a big smile and said, I don't know that reverend, Mom, but I'm sure glad he is alive. In New York, you're famous for it. We're going to keep Kevin on that <laughs> alive. Unrelenting between Sodom and Zion. And Kevin is not alone because Kevin is going to go all the way back to 1761. <laughs> and that's the other Kevin. <laughs> well, that's a, that Where things <laughs> began. <laughs> uh, yeah. My ancestors. Yeah, that is yes. an ancestor. Yeah. You want to tell us a little bit about that well, ancestor? He's remarkable. One of the Man. one of the reasons I wrote this book is people kept asking, well, what the uh, questions I continue to get from people is how did you have the stamina to do no, this? No, no, no. Before you can go, let me, let me say this. I got to say this from 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 the other Peter Annette. Yeah. 1761, October the 17th, 1761. A great date, I believe. That's Jesse Jackson's birthday. I can't remember. What up? We shall expose the hidden works of the darkness and drive. Falsity to the bottomless pit. Right. Well, that was Peter Peter, Peter Adam, my ancestor. Speaking he, in the free inquiry. He was uh, challenging the dogma and the oppression of the Crown of England and the Church of England, and they locked him in the stocks for it, put him at hard labor when he was in his 70s. And um, people kept asking me, what are the influences? Of, how do you keep going in all this work? And, and I realized that part of it is the my own lineage and the fact that we came from a long line of free thinkers and rebels and people who paid the price for doing these things. We were Baptists in England when it was a crime to be a Baptist. We had to come to Canada for that reason. Um, and it's, it's kind of ironic because my ancestor had been a British Army officer who fought at Waterloo and was given wa land in what was called Upper Canada. It's Ontario now. Waterloo. What is Waterloo? The Battle of Waterloo, 1815, where the British fought Napoleon. And uh, they, as he, a British officer, he was given all this land in Canada, uh, from taken from Native people. And in a way, I often viewed it as perhaps part of the way that I compensated that in our own family for having done that, um, trying to get to the truth of what my people had done in the name of their God. To uh, to so mm -hmm. many other people, native people. Well, that's unrelenting. Between Sodom and Zion. Now we to this title. Between Sodom and Zion. Talk about this title, Kevin. I'm really excited by it. Well, it uh, when I started in this work, I didn't really understand what I was dealing with. You know, I thought that well, if you tell enough of the truth. You get enough of the eyewitnesses to tell the, the, their stories. The people who are responsible will sit up and say, yeah, we're wrong, let's do justice. But you know, I had to f get a few whacks in the head uh, to realize that what I uncovered was the norm of things, was a way that this society is. And I was blind to that for a long time. And I realized that I had been thrown out of a fallen city, if you like, Sodom. Um, there is a judgment, I believe, on my culture and my people for what we have instigated in the world for many centuries. And I don't mean simply white people, because any culture yeah. can fall prey to this. Mm -hmm. A lot of the native chiefs today in Canada are part of the problem as well, because they've been given benefits to cover up this story as well. Um, but it is the, the, the culture that maybe my people epitomize that is devastating the planet and is, has so much blood on its hands that I don't think it's redeemable. I think there we have to leave the, the fallen city, if you like, and head to Zion, the new city. We got to we got to reclaim the world. We got to reclaim our own souls and our own minds, 
And I learned that the hard way by having a lot stripped away from me in life, my family, my children, my livelihood. But I'm glad for all that now because it opened my eyes, my heart. I was captive to four. I was a captive of the city in S of Sodom, if you like. You were captive in Sodom. I was you captive. You know, Kevin begins his career in Sodom. As really, you've got to read this story. It's, it is at this book. It's absolutely revealing of who Kevin is. I've been meeting with Kevin a few years now, but nothing brought me to know Kevin like unrelenting between Sodom and Zion. I like that, Zion. But Kevin, as a young, young man in Canada, a kid, so to speak, a brassy little <laughs> up in <idiot> brat. <laughs> yeah, that's what my dad called. Like, I knew so many of in Mississippi and Alabama and Georgia mm -hmm. in the civil rights struggle. Uh, Kevin was, was young and very bright. He was not a, a child of great poverty. Uh, Kevin and Word, we would say, you know, we'd be asking him, boy, what's wrong with you? You got plenty. Just go over there somewhere and sit down and enjoy yourself. But not this child. This is an uppity brat. <laughs> and you have to read about this brat. Uh, I was really struck, Kevin, about that first 16 years. Mm. As a young man in school in Canada. Yeah. And in home, in a family, growing up in a family. Can talk with us a bit about that? Because to hear that, I think, is a revelation about why you will be driven to topple the most powerful, one of the most powerful figures on earth, a pope. That's a whole story in itself. Yes, yeah. I know. Bye-bye <laughs> uh, Pope Benedict. Uh, that was directly because of the work we did. But anyway, um, you know, one of the incidents I talk about in there is when I was uh, 14. Uh, we went up, and by we, I mean our United Church Sunday School group, mm -hmm. did an exchange with uh, a native community in northern British Columbia, of the Simshin people. And it was my first encounter with, with native people. I mean, as a Canadian, you see a lot of native people on the street and everything, but you don't really know them. There's mm -hmm. this total apartheid divide, you know, uh, still very much today. And we went up to this village, which was very much untouched. And I remember ge I described, we get off the bus, and... I had never seen children um, so wild and free. Like, mm -hmm. they had a lot of trouble. I remember a lot of them were sick, and uh, they were going around without shoes, proper clothing. One little girl had a, a mark on her head. They, her dad had hit her with an ax when he was drunk. Yeah. I mean, you know, like, it was a totally different reality, like, if you like, third world reality. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. yet these kids were um, just freer than anyone I had ever met. And mm -hmm. they didn't seem to have the apprehension and fear that my growing up in my culture you have as a child, right? Where you're always being told to do something rather than what you want to do, but do somebody else's notion of what's right, you know. So um, I mean, uh, these kids were uh, in the village. They were all running around totally uh, unconstrained. And then the, the clan mother shows up. This woman gets out of the car, and they're all quiet. <laughs> and they're all showing this total respect. And... I realized later, my dad told me that was the chief. I thought that was my mama, but go well, ahead. <laughs> <laughs> that's the thing. Like, despite all of the genocide and everything yeah. that they had lost, they retained that respect that I never saw, like in my culture, right? Mm -hmm. So that told me something right there. And I remember that night just having my whole world had been totally blown apart. Just by that little taste that there was a different reality right in my own backyard I didn't know about. It. And still to this day, when I talk about these crimes that happened, Canadians can't believe it. And I said, that's because you don't know what's going on in your own backyard. But Kevin, you know, you had a lot going on in your backyard and your front yard too. Um, you're talking about the upheavals and talking about the Maya. Talk a little bit about meeting the mm. Maya and, and how that came to be. Meeting Maya? From Mexico, way yeah. up in old, well, old Mexico. <laughs> yeah, I'm in old, old Mexico called Canada these days. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was when I was uh, training for the ministry. Uh, when I was 30, I decided to, uh, I didn't have a burning bush experience or anything like that. <laughs> a boy telling me to go to the church. You didn't burn any bush either. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was half my life ago. I'm 60 now. And, uh, but... They, um, I went down on to Chiapas, Mexico. Mm -hmm. uh, this is before the Zapatista rebellion, but it's the same area among mm -hmm. the Maya, the Mayan people, and these were Mayan refugees from Guatemala, uh, mm -hmm. from the military, the genocide there that that happened, and uh, they were living in refugee camps along the border, 
And I went down there to, uh, I was part of kind of a f church fact-finding tour to, to, to see how we can help these people, right? Which mm -hmm. is ironic, because the very same church sponsoring us to do that had been killing off their own Indians in Canada, the That's United right. Church, right? right? So it's always easier to look uh, for their field mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. what's going on. But anyway, I remember when I got there, uh, again, it was like going up to the village in northern BC when I was a teenager. There are kids running around every day, something like 30 to 40 children would die of malnutrition and typhus and things like that. And uh, the priest who was there, he was funny, he was an ex-Catholic priest who had been, like I would be one day, defrocked mm -hmm. for getting mm -hmm. too close mm -hmm. to the Indians, right? <laughs> and uh, That's why I want to read this name. Yeah, he's, <laughs> F Father Fidel, his name was. And, uh, Fidel. Fidel, his name. So he took <laughs> the name. Because <laughs> the, the bishop tossed him out because he was getting too radical in his sermons, right? Yes. Uh, too too much like Jesus, you know. <laughs> so anyway, uh, but what's amazing? Two years after I met him, he was actually killed. A uh, landowner, mm. uh, a, a death squad. Yep. Yes. Although they didn't kill him. I mean, there's no way you can kill that spirit, right? No. But um, anyway, why is uh, it still going? He was he was showing me around the village, the the refugee camp, and these little kids were running around, and they had rickets. They they were barely able to walk, and yet with total innocence, total acceptance, and they took us into one of their little um, shacks and gave us lunch. And besides the tortillas, on our plate were little piles of eggs, which were the only eggs in the camp. Huh? The only eggs they had, which should have gone to those children, were given to us, their, their guests. Yes. Because that's in the Mayan tradition, their ancient custom. The honor, yeah. And I didn't want to, but then I realized, to honor these people, you got to do it not on my terms, but on theirs. Mm -hmm. And that was a real mm -hmm. lesson for me. And it was kind of funny because the priest was watching me the whole time because maybe he sensed that I was going to face that same kind of dilemma one day when I had to choose between do I do what the church tells me or what my conscience is telling me yes. about what, how we're treating Native people. Well, you know, Kevin, you had the my experience, but you had another experience. I am just amazed when I read Unrelented Between Sodom and Zion by Kevin Annette. Because uh, you could lead it up to this powerful story about what's happening in Canada with the genocide and your work to overthrow that genocide. Your work to expose to the world the highest church and the oldest church on earth, the Catholics. Mm -hmm. The oldest known church, y'all don't get confused now. Um, the Catholics. But Kevin, what do you got to do with Venezuela? Venezuela? Yeah. Um, you mean in the book? Yeah. I'm trying to remember that part. Yeah, it, I turned 60. You're testing they, my they memory come, They come to visit. <laughs> <laughs> they come to Canada. Which part are you referring to? Uh, the very early part where you're meeting people in Canada when they're coming in as refugees. Oh, Guatemala. That's Guatemala? Yeah. Okay, all right. I was well, wondering, Venezuela, Guatemala. Well, anyway. that's the same people to me. They, um, yeah, you're right. Uh, but, um... The, when I was a teenager in high school, uh, the last year I was in high school, the coup, military coup in Chile mm -hmm. happened. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it's oh, it's Chile. In and Chile, it's but well no, Chile. but it, yes. Chile and Guatemala, uh, yes. all the same, you know, genocide there, yes, political yes, genocide, yes. if you like. Um, after the, the coup in Chile was one of the uh, incidents that totally shocked my life and redirected me along mm -hmm. a really hard political path because after I met the refugees from the coup, I realized that I was part of a system that was willing to reach out thousands of miles and destroy another people just because they didn't like their left-wing politics. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I didn't want to be part of a society that would do that. So I wanted to change that society fundamentally. I guess it made me a revolutionary. We're talking about a kid. So yeah. that's, that's what so I'm I was, looking at. You I were was, just a kid. I was 17. And uh, so I began to get to know these Chilean refugees. I was part of a lot of the protests, you know, against mm -hmm. after the mm -hmm. coup. I remember going into the U.S. Embassy, uh, it was a consulate, the United States consulate in Vancouver, and uh, w lying down and having someone pour cattle blood on me to represent a corpse in Chile. Like, mm -hmm. we're doing that kind mm -hmm. of street theater right there. And mm -hmm. I, I remember my parents, well, my, mom, mom, my mother was shocked. My dad wasn't. He was very cool, like he still is. But um, mom thought it was going to ruin any chance I'd ever have for a job. And maybe it was true. I don't know. Who cares? But... Um, Th those kind mom of cared. mom <laughs> care, the mom's care, right? Mom's care, right? But um, that I was being exposed to a lot of these people who had not just talked, but they had put everything on the line to try to change things for the poorest mm -hmm. and for all of the people, not just the wealthy, right? And it made me a, a, a deep spiritual radical, not just 
kind of, um, you know, political radicalism can often be just here, mm -hmm. but I yeah. felt it in my bones mm -hmm. that I couldn't be part of the system anymore. I had to, the only home, the way I put it there is the only home I really had was a possible future society. That's why yeah. I saw it, right? And so struggling for that society became the focus of my life for the next 40 years. And you, and you met a brother who would help you with us, an older brother. Yeah, you a few hung of out them. with. A few of them. And, um, yeah. and they were actually guides for you. Yeah. M mentors who helped you along the road. Uh, so I'm right, but I, when I was reading this, I was laughing because I was remembering the Ella Bakers and uh -huh. I was remembering the C.T. Vivians and I was remembering the Fred Shuttlesworths and I was remembering the Medgar Evers and all of these wonderful guides we had as young people yeah. in the Deep South yeah. building the Civil Rights Movement. Yeah. But Kevin, it wasn't quite like this. We were not up against the Pope himself. <laughs> <laughs> a paper tiger, as somebody <laughs> once said. <laughs> that pope is not a paper tiger. That church is not a paper well, tiger. Well, I know, yeah. But, I mean, the, the way they rule is mostly through deception. Yes. Um, but, I f I, you know, I found that um, ultimately it comes down, Kolya, to a personal choice. Mm -hmm. You know, and do we have the capacity in ourselves to actually say no, not just in words, but in every day how we live? What's going to be the focus every day of what we do? Mm -hmm. Nine to five existence? Or saying, what's happening to that person who we're about to crush? What's happening to that native child who's about to be trafficked? Mm -hmm. uh, and that happens so widely now. That's one of the focuses of what I do now, a lot of the, the document of the child trafficking and, and how it got started in these Indian boarding schools. Mm -hmm. So... Well, Kevin, you not only documented the child trafficking, you took that case to the world. Mm -hmm. You had the audacity, the bold nerve and audacity to go to Europe. Can you talk with us about that? Well, that was in 2010 after we had forced the Canadian government to issue a, like a formal apology for the genocide in Canada. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, you can get that in my other book, Murder by Decree, which is both books are on at Amazon.com. Mm -hmm. um, but um, after the success of forcing the truth of genocide out into the open in Canada, groups in Europe heard about that, and I was first invited to Ireland, where my ancestors had come from. In fact, my great grandfather left there on a on what was called a coffin ship, where the mm. British forced them off their land. His entire family died of typhus and starvation on the on the boat over. And uh, not the entire, because I got you, Kevin. Well, that's right. But <laughs> great grandfather survived. <laughs> Daniel O'Neill is the one. Yeah. And it was strange going back to that land where the same genocide had happened. Um, I was invited by a group of survivors of, uh, they call it abuse, but it was torture at a young age by Catholic priests. Uh, and of course, it happened so much in the Catholic Church because there's a policy that actually says when children are raped, the police are not to be told. And any priest who squeals, gets excommunicated. I mean, that's yeah. a standing policy. And in that kind of regime... Has that changed? Never. It's not changed. Even the present pope... Uh, uh, the present pope that hasn't changed. ...supports it, uh, supports the policy of covering up in-house child rape. So that causes a lot of crimes, and th the victims of that crime invited me over. So I began to give some talks in 2010 in, in the spring in, in Ireland, and then from there, all over Europe, people were hearing about this, and I was getting to offers to come and not only give talks, but actually set up what became the International Tribunal in the Crimes of Church and State, and that's the the group International Tribunal into the Crimes of Church and State. ITCCS.org. Um, it eventually sponsored a common law court trial that found Pope Benedict and others guilty of genocide, including the Queen of England, Prime Minister of Canada. Um, now let's go, let's back. So it found Pope Benedict and the Queen of England and others. Guilty of crimes against humanity under international law, conducted in a, in a bona fide lawful court uh, that was convened in Brussels, looking at the evidence uh, and uh, coming up with a guilty verdict. Now, in the same two-week period, in February 2013, when that verdict was announced, Pope Benedict resigns. And we know he resigned as a result of what we're doing because the Spanish government had issued them a note, issued the Vatican a note, saying that if the Pope comes to Spain, he may be arrested because of the evidence in our, in our indictment, mm -hmm. showing mm -hmm. that the Vatican is a child trafficking criminal body. So when he resigned, that was a signal to the whole world that even the mightiest ruler in the world can be brought down with simple truth and people willing to act on the law and not simply, you know, talk about it, but actually convict these people. 
Canada's most scented story and the man who brought it to light. Not just to light, but the man who, because of his work, was able to force one pope down and is still exposing the crimes against children and others by the Catholic Church, the Anglican Church, and the Crown of England. And the United Church of Canada, my former <laughs> employer. <laughs> and the United Church of Canada. Can't leave them out. Unrelenting. <laughs> Unrelenting. Between Sodom and Zion. Kevin is on a book tour. We, you've got to catch this man because you've got to get this book. Go to Amazon.com. You can get this book. Uh, his other book, which is really the huge documentation of the crimes of genocide in Canada, Murder by Decree. The census stories that Canada does not want us to hear, doesn't want us to hear. When we go to talking about children in Canada and the people of Canada and the native people of Canada, be sure that you understand New York. You can just transfer it right across the border to the United States of America. Well, we continue these same crimes. Today, as I speak to you, some native woman is screaming rape. Some child is missing. Some concentration camp that natives live on are invaded. I invite you, please, to tune in to Brass Tax with Frederick Brass, the Frederick Brass, Brass Show. Tune in. You will find men like Kevin on that, women like Kevin on that. You will find the great stories, the judicial violence stories. And I look forward to seeing you this summer at Preston Theological Seminary to talk about judicial violence in the United States of America. We're bringing together a hundred of the finest African minds there are in the United States. That is, blacks who have been here through the enslavement, who are documenting these crimes, as Kevin has documented these crimes. Please, please, we owe it to ourselves, to our posterity. Murder by decree, the crime of genocide in Canada. Kevin, it's been my pleasure. Thank always you, Always my pleasure. It's always good to be to here. To have you come. Yeah and to be able yeah. to talk with you and yeah. to share and tonight to also d d d d not <laughs> come to you. <laughs> <laughs> I love Venezuela. <laughs> Venezuela with Chile <laughs> and the Linda and, and all of these other crimes that we yeah. are so guilty of, mm -hmm. Canada and the U.S. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Coley. <laughs>